on Hooks Newsmaker Saturday starts now. And thanks for joining us. There are over 42,000 inmates in Arizona's prisons. Is that too many? Is it costing the state too much? Is the system working? The incarceration debate is seen by many as a trade off between public safety and public finance. Are more prisons the only option we have for controlling crime? That is the topic this week on Fox 10 Newsmaker Saturday. Let's get started. And my guest this week on Newsmaker Saturday is Pat Nolan, a noted expert on prison reform who is asking some very probing and detailed questions, challenging long-held assumptions about crime and incarceration. Thanks for joining us, Pat. Great to see Thank you. Thank you so much, John. You grew up on Crenshaw Boulevard in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. that, that's a pretty tough area. It was. And every member of my family was a victim of crime. Uh, How'd you end up a Republican? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, uh, the conservatives, I, I grew up in the Reagan era. I was involved in every one of his campaigns from the beginning. And his slogan was common sense uh, answers to California's problems. And he was. He was a very commonsensical guy. Uh, he had the answers. He turned the state from deficit into a surplus. Uh, he, uh, you know, was pioneering in uh, trying new solutions uh, to things. And Let's talk about that for a minute okay. because you're part of this group forward that analyzed mm -hmm. data from Arizona Department of Corrections covering more than 30 years mm -hmm. and half a million records. Mm -hmm. What's the conclusion about how we're doing in terms of incarceration in Arizona? What, what is the issue? That we overuse incarceration. We certainly need prisons. But they're for people we're afraid of. And more and more Arizona is locking up people we're just mad at. There are other ways to hold them accountable than sending them to prison. Uh, but the, the increase, uh, you know, uh, Arizona's the fourth highest state in the uh, percentage of its people right. that are incarcerated. And it's uh, doubled uh, over a short period of time. And most of that growth has been in nonviolent crime. Let's talk about that. Uh, uh -huh. Drug possession in Arizona prisons. 20% of the prison population is drug possession. Yeah, that, Does that that's strike astounding. you as too much? Oh, way, way, way too much. Now people, you know, the other side argues, well, you know, they probably did other things. But, you know, that's not our justice system. Our justice system says you're accused of a specific crime, and that's the crime for which you're incarcerated. Not that you might have done something else somewhere sometime. And frankly, there are people that we're really afraid of, people that are violent and that do great harm to others. And that's where our resources ought to be uh, focused, not on a, somebody, uh, you know, smoking a joint or even somebody that's selling a few uh, joints to support their own habit. The, the, um, the number of people sentenced for the lowest drug crime, simple possession in Arizona, has grown from 1,400 roughly in 2000, the year 2000, to 3,400 in 2017, more than doubling in just 17 years. And that's you know, drug crimes. Yeah, uh, and, and that's just drug possession, not possession for sale. People are astounded when they hear that. They think, oh, we don't send people to Are the to possessors, that? though, that we're putting away mm -hmm. generally people also trafficking? Well, they're small-time dealers. One of the things that we advocate is do it on the role they play in the conspiracy. If they're obviously high up the chain, if they're importing it across the border or state lines, absolutely. You know, but if they're selling it to their buddies, you know, to support their habit, yeah, yeah, yeah that's bad. It's against the law. They should be held accountable. But sending them to prison destroys their lives, but also costs the taxpayers a whole heck of a lot. Let's talk about that because uh, in your report, you point to two states, neighboring states, that are doing it better and mm -hmm. saving money. And these are not exactly liberal states. We're talking about Texas and Utah. What are they doing that we're not doing? They're uh, prioritizing prison beds, which are very, very expensive. You know, you, you could send your child to Harvard for less than it costs to lock somebody up for a year in prison. Wow. So, you know, they, for a uh, year or for a year. OK. Yeah. Uh, so our priorities are wrong. That's not uh, again. There are people that's worth that, but not not the uh, pot user. 
And uh, so we, we say we're overusing prison and that uh, if a sentence does more harm than the underlying crime, boy, it's out of whack. That's not justice. So how do you, how do you blunt the, the argument that in the late 70s, early 80s, we started really locking up people? Mm -hmm. We started really mm -hmm. getting on a, a, a crusade to mm -hmm. lock up criminals, thinking mm -hmm. that if you lock up troublemakers, then there's less trouble on the street. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was one of them. And then the crime rate did go down. Yes. Uh, but it's really interesting if you take Arizona and compare it to Utah and Texas, our crime rate has gone down, but not nearly as much as Texas and Utah, even though they've cut their prison population. Uh, in the last decade, 35 states have reserved prison beds for truly dangerous people and uh, punished the others in the community at far less cost and more effectively. And the interesting thing is the crime rates lower in those that cut their prison population because they did it intelligently. Let's talk about your kind of your group forward. Um, before you think that this is a bunch of Democrats involved in this or people who are soft on crime or whatever you may, whatever preconceived idea you might have, your ideas of your group are supported by the governor of former governor of Texas, current U.S. Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry, a Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Reform. Newt Gingrich is with you. J.C. Watts, former congressman mm -hmm. from Oklahoma, is with you. This is not some no, cabal this is not trying some, to uh, right. disband this, prisons. Right. This is not some dreamy liberal group. I, I represent the American Conservative Union, uh, which is a pillar of the conservative movement. We're the ones that sponsor CPAC every year. Mm -hmm. 15,000 conservative grassroots activists. And they all stand with us on criminal justice reform. When you think about it, we, of course, need prisons, but giving government that much power, the ability to take you away from your family, from your job, from your church, from your neighborhood, and control everything you do with your life, including putting you at great risk of violence or rape, that should be done very cautiously. Instead, as you said, we went on almost a binge of incarceration. And the fascinating thing is, yes, it had an impact lowering crime, but you know, ec econo or economists will tell you there's a law of diminishing returns. And we've so overused it that now it's only marginal, if at all, that we get a benefit from it. The United States locks up more people than any other country in the world, by far, by multiples. And, you know, it's not just uh, banana republic it, uh, republics, it's England, France, mm -hmm. Germany. Now, you can make two options there. Either we're the most evil people in the world, which I don't think, or our system is really screwed up that ends up incarcerating so is many there, of our people. Is there a profit motive in the prison um, complex that that drives this, that drives I, uh, policy decisions about building more prisons, for instance, or yeah, privatization yeah. of prisons. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an agnostic on the privatization because, frankly, government prisons are just as rapacious as the privates. You know, they have a vested self-interest, too. Mm -hmm. All those employees with their pensions, and you look at what they complain about, it's not public safety although they have a veneer of that. It's about job benefits, about hiring more people. There are towns that try to recruit prisons sure. as an economic development tool. That's terrible. Are we, the, the recidivism rate is what? Uh, it's gotta be over 50%, right? Uh, it hovers around 50% nationally, yeah. So this leads to an inevitable discussion about what, what is happening in these prisons that's particularly productive. Right. Essentially, we're warehousing prisoners. You know, so we're taking we, bad people off the street to keep them out of society so they can't reoffend. Right. We're warehousing them. Right. To... And, and that uh, sequestering of them does 
have an impact. They're not harming other right. people. I but, mean, it makes sense. If, if you put uh, the bad guys away, they're not able to reoffend. But uh, Newt Gingrich says if you take a low-level drug user or dealer even and put them in a cell with a murderer or a rapist, who do you think is going to come out more like the other? You know, there, there, a lot of people leave prison worse than they went in and more dangerous because the skills you need to survive inside prison inherently make you more dangerous when you get out. Do you think the DUI laws are too tough? Well, actually, as a legislator, the, my first bill was a DUI lowering it to 0 0.10, and then I supported lowering it to 0.08. Uh, certainly Do you think it for, should go lower? Uh, um, no, I, I, I don't think lower. Uh, frankly, it depends a, a lot on the level of your impairment. You know, uh, a 100-pound uh, woman like my wife obviously, uh, you know, takes a lot less alcohol sure. to, to get her drunk. The, the key thing, though, is are they repeat offenders? You know, n to nobody should the, drive under the In the influence. state prison, though, you've almost got to be a repeat offender or you have to have killed someone, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm not aware of the laws in Arizona. I would assume so. And that's what my legislation did How in did California. you get on this crusade about uh -huh. trying to look at prison reform? Well, I went to prison. I was a legislator in California and uh, targeted for prosecution, I think, for political reasons. What was the offense? Uh, uh, supposedly tying my vote to a contribution. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is I had voted for the bill seven times without ever asking for any contribution. So you had li you lived yeah. this. You went to yeah. prison, federal yeah. prison, for how long? Uh, for 29 months. Okay, federal prison is a far different thing than, than the, the video state. we're showing in yeah. Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, uh, but the key thing about prison is it's your total lack of control over your life. And that's what, did what it people do to don't you? realize. Uh, first, it drew me closer to God. The only way I could make it through it was my faith. I was raised in a family where faith was strong, but I tell people I went into prison believing in God, and I became, came out knowing him. And I saw among the, the other inmates that, yeah, some of them had done terrible things, other minor things, but that there was redemption was possible they were redeemable. for all of them. Absolutely. I've had this similar experience interviewing a lot of prisoners. Now, you know, you usually get a story that they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and some say, the, the common thing that I would hear from prisoners is, there are good people who do bad things. Mm -hmm. And none of us should be judged by the worst thing we ever did in our life. Okay? Not permanently judged by it. Right. right. Short of murder and rape. That, right. That I think I, no, I would take and, exception and to. And again, the, the harm done by the crime should match the harm done by the sentence. And so if you get into taking another person's life, that total disrespect for their humanity, mm -hmm. you're not entitled to a lot. Uh, you've forfeited your rights. Yeah. Now, I also don't think they should be tortured and beaten, uh, raped. What about death uh, penalty? Uh, our organization doesn't take a stand. I'm personally against it. And the reason is we represent an imperfect system. There's no guarantee that it's right. You look at the number of exonerations, well over 2,000 now, of people that have been found right. DNA, innocent. DNA, yeah. primarily yeah. driving And that. DNA only affects a certain percentage of the mm -hmm. population. The other people, they could be wrongly convicted. and There is no uh, DNA. Yeah, and you know, eyewitness testimony is inherently unreliable. When we come back on Newsmaker Saturday, we're going to get into the question of if we were to save money on prisons and incarceration, where would that money maybe go and mm -hmm. be better spent? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that with Pat Nolan, an expert on prison reform. His group, Forward, analyzed data from Arizona and came up with some pretty startling conclusions about our incarceration rate and whether we're getting the best bang for our buck that we could. Back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday. Back on Newsmaker Saturday with Pat Nolan. He is part of this group, Forward, that has analyzed uh, Department of Corrections data in Arizona and arrived at some very, very interesting conclusions about what we're doing and why. He is a former California state lawmaker, uh, served some time in federal prison. 
um, over, I guess, a, what, cash for vote scandal? Campaign contribution. Okay. Yeah. So he's kind of been on all sides of this. Let's, take, let's talk about the money. We talked mm -hmm. about this in the last segment. Uh, in Arizona, this is a fascinating, this comes from your group's report. If Arizona imprisonment rate matched Utah's post-reform rate, they've done some reform in Utah, we would have saved $620 million a year. Texas has already, they've done some of these reforms, trying to lessen the amount of people who are locked away, and they've saved $3 billion. Texas is a death penalty state. They are a hang em high state. They're tough on crime. Why did Texas well, arrive at this, at this kind of uh, epiphany, I guess? Well, by being more selective who you spend, send to prison, concentrating on those that really are a danger to the people. Rapists, murderers. Uh, right. They were able to assault, save $3 billion, but even more important, their crime rate dropped to the lowest, lowest point since 1967. So it actually made the public safer by sending fewer people to prison because they concentrated on those who were then, and your question, what to do with the money, they put it into, a large part of it went into drug treatment, mental health services, uh, family counseling and reconciliation, anger management, job training, uh, matching them with mentors to try to... We're talking about uh, Texas uh, here. This oh, isn't, yeah. This right. isn't Massachusetts. But again, or... we want... Uh, and that's what Grover Norquist says. You know, if Vermont had done this, everybody would say, huh, yeah, it's so Vermont. what? But tough on crime Texas, that gets people's attention. And they're enthusiastic about it. They weren't pushed into this. They led the way on this because they saw a way out of the skyrocketing costs with continued high crime rates and said, we've got to change the way we do this. In Arizona, you're aware, you know, we've, we've had a, a big debate in this past year over mm -hmm. teacher pay, education funding, which is already mm -hmm. half of the state budget, the entire state budget, K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like we're not spending on education, but it seems to never be enough. Mm -hmm. Is this a case where states are seeing some savings realized that is going back into education? Yes. Does it alleviate that debate? Well, it helps with it. As you said, it may never be enough. A, a little anecdote in the California legislature, Leroy Green was a, uh, a Democrat, chairman of the Education Committee, supported by the teachers' union, and they kept asking for money, for more money, and finally he said in exasperation, you know, I could give you a blank check and you'd still <laughs> tell me it's not enough. <laughs> but it has helped with that. It's helped with roads in Texas. Okay. But more important is this shouldn't be bled off to other things. A big chunk of it needs it, it's to a fix these people. Right. And you believe they're fixable. Oh, a absolutely. What percentage of the, of the folks in, in state prison in Arizona do you believe mm -hmm. are truly fixable? Well, everyone there's an opportunity to. Of course, they have to make the choices. But what we found, I, I worked you with... You see the pictures uh, of guys, you know, hanging mm -hmm. out in the yard. Not much is going on here. Right. But what if they spent that time productively? What if they were learning skills? And that's, on the federal level, the First Step Act is meant to change prisons from being warehouses to being preparation to lead healthy, contributing, law-abiding lives and tax-paying lives, to make them, teach them how to be a good parent, a good employee, how to, uh, you know, uh, J.C. Watts says, good character is what you do when nobody's looking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Teaching them that, that's self-restraint. We don't not have enough cops to lock up everybody that a bad idea pops into their head. So there has to be, you have to teach them self-restraint. Let's talk a, a bit about um, the states. We talked about Utah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Texas. Other states that are doing this and starting is a pendulum. Do you believe the pendulum is swinging? Oh, absolutely. And again, mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to make it a, a political thing, but it's a political program. Mm -hmm. You believe there's buy-in now from rock yes. rib Republicans. Yes. Who generally are lock them up, tough on crime. We've seen it here in Arizona. But we've shown them that for all the money we're spending, we're not getting enough public safety. That's the thing. They're getting uh, gypped out of, out of that. So Georgia has not only reformed their adult system, their juvenile system, their probation system. Louisiana, which had the highest incarceration rate in the nation, 
just passed reforms that brought it down. It's no longer the leader. Um, it, it, you know, Ohio, uh, Indiana, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania. How do you how do you blunt this argument that people basically? you know, look at the criminals locking them up for long periods of time. They believe it's been the most effective strategy in bringing the crime rate down. They just believe that the troublemakers, if you lock them up, the rate will go down and you don't have to deal with them. Well, to follow that to its logical extreme, let's lock everybody up. We'd eliminate crime. <laughs> you know, uh, the fact of the matter is, yes, we do need to lock some people up, but the, the, the pot user, is, is that worth, you know, forty to $60,000 a year plus probation? It's astounding to realize that one out of every 43 Americans is, uh, you know, uh, incarcerated. One, one out, out of, of every... Right. One out of every 98 is either incarcerated or on supervised release. One out of every 100. So, you know, you go to a... A ball game. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that they're under control of the government. Again, we're not the worst people in the world. Why on earth are we locking people up as we are? Again, we need prisons. We need the bad guys locked up. How's this but, being received here in Arizona? I mean, I can think of some people right off the, off the top of my head. Bill Montgomery would not like this conversation very much. Well, but Bill is a public servant. And the public is more and more demanding this. Uh, that's what we found in other states. When Rick Perry did this in Texas, he was reluctant at first. He discovered it made him very popular. Wow, because Im immediately the, the, the knee jerk would be, if I come out soft on crime, I'm going to get but killed. But this isn't soft on crime. People try to characterize it as that, but it's not. This is smart on crime. Yeah, we're making the public safer. I would challenge those that are for building more prisons and spending billions of dollars on it. What's conservative about that? Building a huge bureaucracy that sends people home more dangerous than they went in? Chuck Colson said, only a nation that's rich and stupid would continue to pour billions of dollars into a system that leaves offenders' conduct unchanged, victims' needs unmet, and communities still living in fear of crime. And yet that's our current system. And you believe, we've got about a minute, in mm -hmm. Arizona, what's the reaction been? How's this been received, your, your message and, and the report? I, I think the more people learn, and forwards numbers are hard to argue with. They lay it out. That those are facts. We're finding more and more acceptance. Now, Arizona's reluctant bridesmaid, I'll tell you, it's a tough sell. As tough it, as It was Texas? easier in Texas. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're here to talk and work, and, you know, I live in Prescott, and uh, the conversation has really started here. And in Prescott, how's it going over? That's a pretty conservative place. Yeah, but, you know, the people, uh, you know, it's small enough that people know each other. They know the kids mm -hmm. that went to prison. They know the habitual offenders, but they also right. know those that are worthy of a second chance. So, actually, it's very popular there. There's even discussion that President Trump is back door working on this with, with Not lawmakers. Not back door, front door. He's made statements. He wants the legislature. He's with you. Conquer. Absolutely. He's made statement after statement. Give me a reform bill and I will sign it. The last hindrance is Mitch McConnell. He won't let this come to a vote in the Senate. And we're doing all we can to crank up the heat. Thanks, Pat John. Nolan, great to see you. I really Thank appreciate you. it. It was a great yeah. conversation. We're back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday. Pat Nolan, our guest. Thank you. Thanks. Great stuff. Very interesting. <music> Special thanks to my guest, Pat Nolan. A very interesting conversation about uh, crime and punishment in Arizona. I want to remind you, please reach out. Love to hear your thoughts about Newsmaker Saturday and our new time. John Hook. Fox 10. It's very easy to find. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. We'd love to get your feedback. And we will see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday. Thanks for your time.